I don't know. I don't know if I should turn the game down or not. Or uh, stuck on pitch over here. Check one two, check one two, check one two, check one two, check one two. Check check one two. Check one two, check one two. Hmm. Is that yeah, I'm just just kinda wondering, I'm just a little concerned about this my vocal here. Check one two. Yeah, I got the whole soundboard on my iPad. Nothing here, so I'm gonna change these batteries out because God knows how long. They're. She's got the <laughs> bought those Amazon ones, and those Amazon ones don't last long enough. Oh, that's right. They were plugging back. Yeah. Oh yeah. Lyrics of the different songs over the history. Yeah, 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 yeah. I think you would really enjoy it. Is it the Hanniger? We go. We've been there a couple times. I think we went. Uh, did we see? Uh, hello, hi, how are you? <laughs> I guess uh, myself. Hello, check one two. I'm not very high. Okay.
right, everybody. Okay. Well, good morning, everybody. It looks like we're saying good morning. How is everyone this morning? Good, good, good. Hey, um, we're glad you're here. Um, if you're here in our pews, we, there's a little um, uh, connect card. So if you would fill those out, and you can put your prayer requests on those connect cards. You can um, send messages to our staff, whatever you need. Um, put them in the baskets at the exit. And you can join us for coffee and tea in the cafe before or after service. And so now it'll be after service, right? Um, but we're so glad you're here, here online, here in, in this beautiful, wonderful place. I want to let you know that our very own Colby Gallier, you all may remember him. He was in youth group. He's been a part of this church. His family's been a part of this church. Next Saturday at 10 a.m., at F Florida Southern in Lakeland, in the Branscombe Auditorium, Colby will be licensed. Um, and then he can go and serve his church. And this is just an awesome blessing. A blessing for Colby, a blessing for this congregation, and a blessing for the congregation that Colby will be serving. So if you would like to go, um, please call the office to RSVP. And if we get enough people, we'll take the bus. So you don't even have to drive and spend your gas money. We would love to support Colby in all of this. So we hope that you will join us. Would you stand please and join me in the call to worship and invitation to the Holy Spirit today is Pentecost. Oh God, the Holy Spirit come to us and among us. Come as the wind and cleanse us. Come as the fire and burn. Come as the dew and refresh, convict, convert, and consecrate many hearts and lives to our great good and to thy greater glory. And this we ask for Jesus Christ's sake. Amen. So join us. Dave? Dave. 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 Dave's here. Good morning. We're going to start off service this morning off with Blessed Be Your Name.
get the kids to come on up. Kids come Are you guys ready? Yep. There they come. You know, you had a longer run, but you know. So. I have a faster. You have a faster run? That's how I got here first. Did you know there's a race over on the west coast of Florida no. down around Punta Gorda called hey, the Faster don't Pastor don't Race? Marcus. Hey, Marcus, have a seat. Have a Marcus, seat. Marcus, if you don't be good, like you won't get one of those balloons. <laughs> Didn't we talk about rules last week? Hey, wait, wait, wait. I kind of like his rule. What do you think? <laughs> All right. So, what is today? Any idea? They knew. Do you know what it is? Pentecost. Do you know what a pentagon is? Oh, yeah. yeah, we saw it in a shape. It's a shape. It's a shape? Yeah. How many sizes does a pentagon have? Close. No. Divide it by two. He says, what? No. Five. Can you hold up five fingers? Yeah, boom, 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 boom. All right, so a pentagon has five sides. I don't know why that's why you call it Pentecost, but we do. Actually, it's called Pentecost because it's the day that the church was born. No, no, same thing, same thing. The church can be like a pentagon. You know what? Grandma's right behind me. I've got backup today. <laughs> All right, so here we go. There was a guy named Peter. What's Peter's name? Can you say it? Peter. Peter? He might have had a pan, but, you know. <laughs> it was a different day. He didn't wash or cook, so. Peter Pan. Peter Parker? Spider-Man. Yeah. See, you didn't know I knew. I knew, I knew Peter Parker before you were born. All right. Did you really? All right, so here's the deal. Pentecost has nothing to do with Peter Parker. But it has something to do with Peter the Apostle, and he preached... A very long time. Do you, have you ever heard me preach a whole sermon? He preached twice as long as I do. Maybe three times. What do you think about that? And when he preached, <laughs> people came to believe that Jesus is the Son of God and that he rose from the dead. And 3,000 people believed that Jesus rose from the dead and they joined the church. Wouldn't that be awesome? 3,000 people. What would we do with 3,000 people? we got troubles with bathrooms right now. So here's what I want you to remember about Pentecost. Pentecost is when Peter preached. Can you say Peter preached? Can you say it fast? When you're talking tongues. Did it really? Here, let me get it out. All right, so Peter preached. Say Peter preached. Can you say Peter preached? Peter preached. Thank you. People believed. People believed. Help me out. People believed. Peter believed. And God was glorified. And that is Pentecost. And so every day is supposed to be Pentecost. We're supposed to help people believe. And you know, one of the things we use to symbolize, what's that? that's the thing that helps me speak. Do you want red or white? I want uh, red. Red, of course. Red. You want a red one too? This is mine. All right, well, hang on to it. Don't lose it. Oh, gosh. Hey, you want red too? I'm going to have no red balloons before this is done. No, there's one. All right. Okay, now there's going to be like two more. Is there still, still two more? Yeah. All right, can you hang on to, can you do two things at once? Can you hang on to your balloon and pray at the same time? No. No? Well, let's give it a shot. Here we go. Church, help us out. Dear God, Dear God thank you for Pentecost. Thank you for Pentecost. For little boys, little boys and, big boys, and big boys, but most of all, for the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit. that saves all of us. In Jesus' name, Jesus. Amen. 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 All right, have fun with your balloons. Maybe you should tie those to your wrists. Yeah. Just a thought. Nope. Here, wait. Go ahead and get started, Dave. <laughs> you know, if your hand turns red and falls off, I, this is called a disclaimer. I'm a grandpa. It's been a long time since I've done this. Uh, I can't see. You. There you go. Uh, All right. <laughs> What are you going to do? Welcome, Holy Spirit. Oop, wrong song. <laughs> Welcome, Holy Spirit. 
starts with welcome Holy Spirit. <laughs> He's Are you trying to drop a hint? Just say what you Dropping need. There we go. <laughs> Yes, sir. Let's go. Welcome, Holy Spirit. your presence fill me with your power live inside of me welcome Holy Spirit be here with your presence fill me with Never dying father, comforter and counselor, take complete control. instruments. No, we like to do that. Ten thousand reasons. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul. He blesses us every day. Look outside this morning. See that beautiful weather out there. It's more about weather. It's about where we are, where we live. Bless the Lord.
Let us bow our heads in prayer. Oh, dear God, please prepare our hearts. This is such a great Sunday, Pentecost Sunday. And we ask, dear God, that you allow the Holy Spirit to come into each of us and to empower each of us, dear God, to be your servants and leaders. As a community, dear God, of, of believers, we each have that ability to go out and to spread your word and to show others about your love, dear God, in a world that is hurting and so unsure of so many things. Please allow us to make this real, make your word real to them. Allow the Holy Spirit to give us that ability, dear God, to do it. We pray, dear God, that you lead us and guide us in each of our steps as we try to emit your love and grace to not only those that are in this community, dear God, but to those around all of us. This is a responsibility, dear God. It's a humbling and wonderful gift that you've given us that we need to be able to use. We ask for guidance and direction and forgiveness and cleansing, dear God, so that we become the best servants we can of yours. Dear God, in all this we pray as we remember the beautiful prayer which you taught us all. Lord, I'll be thy name. The kingdom come. Thy will be done. On earth, Right. So, we talked about these, right? Baby bottles are due back uh, Father's Day, a couple weeks. Anybody here? We talked about the mugs. Did you mug them, Cindy? Oh, no. Well, especially for first time visitors or if you've been visiting for a while uh, and you didn't get mugged, uh, make sure you stop by the uh, entry and get a mug. It's got chocolate in it as well as a pen, so you'll remember the address of the church. <laughs> And I love these coffee mugs. It says on this side, coffee gets me started, Jesus keeps me going. Okay, so, and if you've been here for a long time and just want a mug, let me know, all right? <laughs> we like to mug people. Uh, I want to also make sure you know that Tuesday night, for those of you who've never done a Bible study with me, this isn't going to be an entire book. Okay, it is. But it's Haggai, which is one of the shortest books in the Bible. It has two chapters. You can do two chapters. In fact, we're going to do them in one night, Tuesday night. It's 6, do we do 6 or 6.30? 6.30, because we practice at 5.45 for, for the second service. So uh, if you've never done a Bible study, bring a Bible. If you don't have a Bible, take one home with you. They're in the pews. Uh, they shouldn't be decorations. They should be being read. So feel free to take one. For, but Haggai is found in the Old Testament in the Minor Prophets. I bet you didn't know there was 10 Minor Prophets, did you? You know, and minor prophets, that seems to be where the United States is heading today, minor prophets. Have you looked at your 401k lately? Just saying. <laughs> so, uh, and the other thing is grief share. For those of us who have experienced significant losses in the last year or so, uh, or even 10 years, sometimes we, it takes a while to process through our pain, our confusion, our, our it comes in waves, and it's not like Kubler-Ross, you know, one and done, go through the five stages. No, no, it's cyclic. So if you need some, some extra work on your grief work, uh, we're going to begin into the month, another cycle. Uh, uh, it's about 12, 13 weeks of grief share, which meets on Sunday afternoons at 4 o'clock. Uh, so that's at the end of the month when we get back from our little break in Indiana. So uh, when Jesus was physically on this planet, isn't that cool? I mean, God chose to physically walk and talk and eat and sleep, argue, fuss and fight. You say, he never did that. Yeah, he did. Don't you remember the whole temple thing where he, he tossed the tables? Jesus was a guy. He just was. I mean, he said uh, he was just like us except one big difference. What was it? He never sinned. That's right. So when he was angry, it was a righteous anger. I got to admit, 90% of the times my anger is not righteous. But it still makes me feel powerful when I'm fearful or powerless. So these people followed this guy, very much a man. 
And uh, they, they listened and they learned. And they came to believe something radical. And it's still radical today. How many Protestant denominations are there? There's about to be another. Actually, there is. There's now two Methodist denominations. Besides AME and United Methodist and all the rest of them. But now we've got Global Methodist Church and the United Methodist Church, which uh, we're in the process of figuring all that out. But if you were to answer five or ten Protestant denominations, you probably missed it by a decimal point. (laughs) There are many, many uh, flavors where we've disagreed on certain things. And so he said, well, you know, you go your way. God will bless you. We'll go our way. Hopefully God will bless us. But in the end, it's all about Jesus, not about all these other things. That's not new. In the day and age when Jesus was born into the culture, into the family, into the religion that we call Israel, the Hebrew faith, uh, they were very specific on who was in the club and who was out. If you were Jewish, you were in, and if you were Gentile or Goyim, a people of the world, then you were out. That's the way it was. And that's not what Jesus taught. He taught us that we all are loved by God. And the thing that was hard for them to hear, and still can be hard for us to hear today, is we're all equally loved by God. So they listened to him, they learned from this guy named Jesus, and it changed something fundamental about their worldview, about their view of God and religion. You see, they went from believing that the God of Israel was just for Israel, to believing through the words and the teachings of the Christ that the God of Israel was there to call Israel back to its original calling, which is found in the Old Testament. God blessed Israel to be a blessing to who? Nations. And so on Pentecost, this is after the death and resurrection of Jesus, on Pentecost, uh, Peter is preaching these kind of truths, that there is a God, and he knows your name, knows your pain, he loves you, whether you're in the club or outside of the club, whether you look like us, sound like us, dress like us, use the same language and worship style we do or not. Uh, The truth is there's only one entry qualification into this club called the church, into this thing called the way, Jesus Christ, and that is to believe that he, in fact, is the Son of God, sent to save all of humanity, sent to teach us the ways of living that will please God, even though sometimes it displeases our neighbor, and then to believe unto salvation. These are the words of Peter on Pentecost, and 3,000 people came to believe. That is a phenomenal statement. God's kingdom on earth is what? Do you know what it is? You just prayed, let thy kingdom come, thy will be done, deep in the Genesis, the account of creation. But the church is called to be this inclusive and yet exclusive community. Everyone's invited. And anyone who accepts the invitation is in. But the truth is, not all accept the invitation. But that day, that day after Jesus' death and resurrection, when you would expect this human who led such a charismatic movement after he'd been brutally killed on the cross at Calvary, you would expect for that movement to die, but it didn't. In fact, it exploded. It exploded. In fact, here, wait, wait, just to see if this will really work. It didn't. There you go. (laughs) And now that you're awake, the movement did explode. Here, Here, let's get into our text today. Peter preached for a long time. How long did Peter preach? You guys got it easy, okay? But then again, he wasn't competing with, you know, Fox or CNN. He wasn't competing with, you know, Facebook and tweets. You know, can you imagine? Anyway, so Peter preached for a long time, and here's what he said. Read it with me, would you, in the yellow. Save yourselves from this generation that has gone astray. Now, we know the generation's gone astray, and what we don't see is we're part of that generation. Uh, Something that many Christians will fuss and fight about is those words. It says, save who? Well, that's not true. Jesus saves us, right? 
He does. But it also says we work out our salvation with fear and trembling. In other words, we recognize just how fallible we are. We recognize how easily we're ensnared by the sins that are our favorite sin du jour, sin of the day. And then we hopefully will look with compassion on others who are struggling or not struggling in their sin of the day. So save yourselves from this generation that has gone astray. If the entire world votes and says something's no longer a sin, but God's word clearly calls it a sin, is it a sin? Oh, God, I, I wish we could vote some of this stuff out, man. <laughs> but we can't. So anyway, so those who believed, not everybody who heard, but those who believed what Peter said were baptized, which means they were brought into the church. They became part of the fellowship and were added to the church. How many? About 3,000. You know, you lose count after about 12, okay? So about 3,000 came in. I think that's a real number. You know, preachers count ears. Most people count noses, you know. How many were in worship today? Oh, about 400. <laughs> But I think it's a real number, about 3,000 people who heard um, Peter preaching on Pentecost, and most of them uh, were probably Jewish because of the, the festival that they're involved in. Ain't me. It ain't me. Dave, are you still on? <laughs> anyway, uh, so they joined with the other believers and devoted themselves to what? what? What did they devote themselves to? So we have a Bible study coming up when? Tuesday night, it's a one-time shot, hour, hour and a half. You'll, you'll, we'll be talking about rebuilding the church through Haggai. Uh, Sunday mornings are really a Bible study. They are. Uh, I try to wrap it in a way that can tickle your funny bone and uh, spark your imagination. But at the end of the day, I teach the Bible. I'm a Bible teacher. I'm not here to convince you of my political views or anything else. You have your own. I've got mine. But we need to see what the Bible says, understand a reasonable way to interpret it, and then apply it to our lives. So that began here at the first Pentecost. Uh, other believers, they've devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to what? So it's not, there's no such thing as a solo Christian. A lot of people act as if you can be a Christian and somehow not be part of a body. If you're alone on an island, you might have to be a solo Christian. But it reminds me of a joke. Everything reminds me of a joke. <laughs> A man was stranded on an island for years, even longer than Gilligan and his crew. He, he was stranded out there for years, and a, a ship comes by finally, and, and they rescue him, and they say, well, we see your hut, and we see two other buildings, and both have crosses on them. And they go, what, what's the deal? He says, that's my church. He says, what's the other building with a cross? And he goes, that's my old church. <laughs> is meant to draw us into a laboratory of love. You may think you're loving and lovable until you're with somebody else who disagrees with you. We are meant to love in significant ways where we feel safe enough and are vulnerable enough to share what we're thinking and feeling so we can be validated and corrected. This is the fellowship. This is the church, the function of who we are together, the Old Testament says is iron sharpens iron. In other words, your soul and God's conversation with you is meant to be in conversation with me and with others so that together we can search the scriptures, find truth, and to discover ways to live that out as individuals and as a group living in this generation that has gone astray. So save yourself from this going astray. Uh, of course, God saves us through Christ, but we must cooperate. That's what's being said through these verses on that first Pentecost, and again, through this preacher on this Pentecost. Everything, everything rises and falls on leadership. It begins with self-leadership. If you're not leading you, you cannot be led by someone else. You make a decision, whether you're 2 or 20 or 102, you make a decision on what you're going to believe and how you're going to act. You choose to follow certain people, ignore others, and actively stand against a certain select few. The Bible says it this way. Save yourself from this generation that's gone astray. It begins with knowing who you are. If you don't know who you are, if you don't know what you'll stand for, then you'll fall for anything. So leadership 
self-leadership and choosing who you will be led by, who you will be led alongside, and who you will lead. Leadership is what Pentecost and this birth of this movement called the way is all about. It's about choosing the path that leads to righteousness and to salvation. What Peter preached is actually recorded for us in Acts 4.12. Of course, it said he preached for a long time. This wouldn't take very long. Uh, There's your leadership in action. It's not just a bright idea. It's the bright idea. The big idea behind Pentecost, read it with me, would you? There is salvation in no one else. There is no other name in all of heaven for people to call on to save themselves. When he preached that to the Jewish community, they're thinking, well, what about Elijah? They're thinking about what about Moses and the Big Ten? What about uh, the prophet Gamaliel, who's still living among us and is teaching us how to live a righteous life? And Peter says to them, there is salvation. You will not rise above the rubble of your life. There is not salvation. You will not escape the slavery of Roman occupation. There is salvation. You will not get out of this life alive. And if you want to go to a place of eternal bliss instead of a place of eternal hell, then you need to know this name. What is that name? The name above all names. Say it like you believe it. Jesus. So he talked for a long time about who? He didn't talk about his cat, didn't talk about his kids. <laughs> he talked about Jesus. So that is a Pentecostal church. It's a talk about leadership. The toughest leadership challenge, according to Bill Hybels, who actually lived out the parable, is self-leadership. Bill Hybels was a great man, is a great man of God, but he let himself fall into the heir of so many men, and it destroyed his personal ministry. It damaged the ministry and the witness of Willow Creek, one of the largest and strongest churches in the world. If you do not understand that Pentecost must begin in here, if you think it's just about balloons and getting excited about a message or getting excited about worship, if there's not that transformation, that new allegiance to this name above all names, this lifestyle that is different than the one that is leading this generation astray. If you think somehow Christianity is just an adornment you wear as a cross on your your neck or your earrings, then you will not understand the power and the purpose of Pentecost. It's about salvation. How many people came to believe and joined the church that day? 3,000. Think about that, man. Can you imagine what it would be like to take in 3,000 new members in this church? In one day, one day. Uh, the parking lot wouldn't be big, big enough, would it? How long would the line be to the restrooms? <laughs> uh, we'd have to add 10 services. 10 additional services. We'd need hundreds of mature leaders, teachers, who could become small group mentors to these people new in their faith. But if you've been in the same lap, the same circuit for 10, 20, 30, 40 years, and you've never taken on leadership responsibility beyond self-leadership, then again, you have missed the power and the purpose of Pentecost. It's about not just adding 3,000 people to the way, to the church 2,000 years ago. It's about adding that many to every church every single year. If you did that, then there would not be an unreached soul on this planet. But instead, we do something else. Can you imagine how exciting it would be to have to hire 20 pastors? (laughs) Hatch, match, and dispatch, you know, to marry, bury, and... (laughs) we just, I don't want to hit this too hard. Thanks for fixing this, Dave. <laughs> Scared, did you hear last week this thing? I was standing over, over, Dave, this is where I was. I was standing over here. I was so glad I wasn't near it. And the thing let loose, came down. It was just like, you know, the walls of Jericho, man. Oh, bam! And first thing I said, first, guess what it was? Tell Dave I wasn't near it. <laughs> but Dave, well, thanks for fixing it. What's that? What are you talking about? I haven't got a clue. I, every, nobody knew because we were focused on, you know, this tragedy. 
the wind was howling, the rain was, uh, yeah, 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 anyway, yeah, yeah. It was like Ken Torrey came to, to the church or something. Anyway, <laughs> no, no, whatever it was, I just found my note and moved right along. Uh, you might as well, because it's all about Jesus, not about furniture. You agree? There you go. All right. So God wants this kind of explosive gross. Uh, not gross, but, you know, buy them by 144 pack, buy them by the gross. No, he wants that kind of explosive gross in every church. You know, some of you are looking at the altar flashing, and you're going, that's not right. That can't be done in my church. Why not? How many remember the discos in 1970s? Yeah, 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 yeah. Staying alive, staying alive. Instead of staying alive, we don't need John Travolta. We need Peter to preach about coming alive. Coming alive. All right? So, you know, Marilyn said, do we need to tone that down? I said, no, no, let her rip. I remember the discos. (laughs) I do. I was always a rock and roller, just, you know, full disclaimer here. Um, Anyway, 3,000 new members. In this series, we've looked at at issues uh, around Jesus, about who he was and and who he uh, lived and died for us to become. One of the things we talked about is he was the greatest leader that's ever lived. He was. If you don't believe that, you don't understand the church, this thing that was born on Pentecost. Uh, it's lasted 2,000 years. It's got millions of members. Uh, the church who's in church triumphant, the ones who've believed and gone on before us, uh, the church militant alive today, and the church that yet is to be born. There is a greater work waiting to be done, not just in Roseland Church, not just in Sebastian, Florida, not just in the United States, but this world. Clearly, the world is coming to a a place where God is going to have to be either lifted up or buried once again. Too much of the church is buying in the waywardness of this generation. I will, to my last dying breath, lift up Christ, him crucified and raised from the dead. Not so that we'll feel better about our personal sin mix, but so that we will receive the power of the Holy Spirit to see sin for what it is, a separation from God, from ourselves, and from others, to see what the Holy Spirit wants to do, not just in my heart, but in your heart, and that distance that is between each of us, our relationships, not just with the ones that are like us, the ones we like, but with this entire planet. There is a season. Everything, Ecclesiastes says, a time to be born and a time to die, and this is not the season of death for the cause of Christ. For those churches that are dead, not just in their trespasses, but dead in their faith, the season is over. Those churches will continue to close at a more rapid pace. This is not one of those churches. This is a church where Jesus Christ is known and lifted up believed upon to salvation and taken out to a dying and lost and hurting world, not in a condemning way, but in a way that beckons them to come, to come out of darkness into light, to come out of confusion into clarity, to come out of pain into a sense of purpose and meaning, even though our pain is real. So Mark 10, 22, no, it must be 32. <laughs> It says, well, here, yeah, that's, I'm behind my, my slides, have you noticed? <laughs> so it is a leadership challenge. And, uh, you know, where is that church, any idea? I believe this is either Southland or Southeast Christian in Louisville, Con- or Lexington, Kentucky. Uh, they, I think it is Southeast, because I think they worship 10,000 people. Did you know, would you agree that is normal? It is. Now, most of the churches in Florida, when I knew the statistic, when I was still active and a lot in the Florida leadership in the Methodist movement, um, the the statistic was this. 70% of the churches, Methodist churches in Florida, worship 70 or less. Now, if you happen to be in Apopka, that probably should still be about 700. But there's very few places where 70 souls is all you can gather on a Sunday morning. We are called to be a Pentecost church, a church that preaches Christ clearly enough that the Holy Spirit comes and compels us to join in this movement where we take charge of ourselves 
work out our salvation with fear and trembling, and we aid others in this same journey that not just helps make sense of life today, but will lead to eternal life forever. Uh, we are coming together as an annual conference. This is the first time in three years that we've gathered in person. And this year we're coming together in Lakeland again uh, at uh, Florida Southern. Anybody been to Florida Southern, now university? It's amazing. Did you graduate? Just went there? Yeah, yeah, I love it. Uh, if you're short, it's a great place. It's a Frank Lloyd Wright art design campus, which means, I think he was about that tall. It means when I walk underneath his covered walkways, I get spots like this on my head. And boom, boom, boom. You know, the first time it's like, oh, yeah, okay. But the third time you go, okay, Jerry, <laughs> what's the Lord trying to teach you here? All right, so here's the deal. We are gathering and we are divided on very significant issues. And the protocol of a peaceful and amicable separation has stalled. And so the Global Methodist Church was launched. And so I don't know about you, uh, I'm hoping you will pray for everybody who's coming together uh, that the spirit of Christ, the spirit of peace, the spirit of reconciliation, the spirit of Pentecost will break out in Lakeland. I want you to come and, and encourage Colby as he enters into his ministry. He's been assigned a church in the uh, Gainesville area. His wife is going to be working on his doctorate, I think, there. Um, so he, this is his first shot. He's going to be here next Sunday and the following, the 12th and 19th. Um, this is your, your chance to encourage this young man, this young couple, as they go off into ministry. When Lisa and I did this, uh, we, were, we came out of seminary and were assigned to uh, uh, Pasadena Community Church. And we started participating in the choir, had about 110 people in the choir, and so that was our small group, right? And, and uh, you know, I was a pastor there, so other small groups. Anyway, he used to be ordained as a uh, deacon on the way to elders, and then you became ordained as an elder. When I was ordained as an elder, I was serving at Pasadena Community Church. And they brought three busloads of people. And in those days, when your name was announced, uh, you walked across the stage, you knelt before the bishop, he laid his hands on you, it could be he or she these days, and uh, friends, I had a couple of friends or elders in the church come and lay hands on me. And there was about 12 people up there. And it was a moment when I stood to my feet and I turned around, I saw two or 300 people standing, cheering, because we had made this milestone. I hope that we can do that for Colby. He grew up in this church. He's one of ours. He's entering ministry very contentious time. So even if you can't be there in person, pray. Pray for Colby and his wife, Hannah, that they can be a voice for Christ in this generation. I'm excited for him, but I am also concerned. So here's how it connects with this story. Uh, they were on their way to Jerusalem. Who's they? The disciples. Uh, the disciples were filled with, filled with what? Dread. And the people following were filled with fear. That's where we're at as a denomination today. Uh, taking the 12 disciples aside, Jesus once more said, when we get to Jerusalem, the Son of Man will be betrayed. They will kill him, but after three days, he will what? Rise again. There are crucial moments in every marriage, in every family, church, denomination, business, or nation. Great leaders see something in others that they cannot yet see in themselves. Great leaders see beyond the trudge of the moment to the destination we're being called through. Yea, though we walk through the valley of the shadow of death. A great leader doesn't sit down. A great leader doesn't encourage others to sit down and wallow in the mud. If you're going through hell, keep on going. Going through hell, keep on going. Like the disciples headed to Jerusalem for the last time with Jesus, our circumstances can fill us with dread. Their circumstances can fill us with fear. You know what? Peace at any price. The old ostrich putting his head in the sand thing. Peace at any price. Pablum is a problem. There, 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 honey. It'll be okay. It'll be okay. Just go ahead and sit and soak. Go ahead and... Give in to the fear. Go ahead and, and just wallow in the failure. Uh, it'll be okay, somehow. Uh, Jesus stated the problem. Jesus is a leader. He says, 
it, it's, I'm going to be betrayed. I'm going to be crucified. I'm going to die. How many of you think that's a problem? Okay, good. Uh, you're awake. You're listening. This is two good things. Uh, so all of us face challenges. Some of us pretend it's not a problem. But somehow we think if we just ignore it. How many of you have a person in your life that if they have a pain, they won't go to the doctor? It happens to be me. I'm a guy, okay? I just walk it off, rub a little dirt on it, walk it off, you'll be fine, right? Uh, I wish my mom was still here to kiss my boo-boos. But <laughs> does that really work? The mom part does, by the way. <laughs> uh, but the rest of it doesn't. Um, when we ignore, when we abdicate self-leadership, when we continue on in a painful reality, it's called addiction. We, we continue to do some unhelpful thing over and over again. I'm feeling the pain. I'm feeling the shame. I'm feeling this difficult moment. And so I'll deal with it with my drug of choice. And it doesn't matter what that drug is. Could be adrenaline. Could be cocaine. Could be alcohol. Could be caffeine. Whatever it is, I'm just not going to deal with the difficulty. Jesus dealt with the difficulty. In a marriage or a relationship, uh, it's not addiction, although it's addictive in nature, a shared addiction is called dysfunction. You enable someone else to be disabled. And in so doing, you enter into this dysfunctional reality. We think that our family is the only family with problems, so instead of getting help, we just pretend it's okay. We hide our difficulties. In the 12-step programs, one of their primary slogans is, you're only as sick as what? You're only as sick as what? Your secrets. You've got to get it out there. You've got to be like Jesus. You've got to say, here's the thing we're dealing with. Let's begin to deal with it. What's the definition of insanity? <coughs> That's right. Do the same thing over and over again, expecting... Anybody know the name of that ship? Titanic. Anybody watch the movie hoping this time it's not going to sink? We can laugh at that, and I love to make people laugh because behind laughter you can see what you won't recognize in the mirror when you get up in the morning. Who's in charge? Is it your addictions? Is it your pain? Is it your afflictions? Is it the dysfunctional ways that you've always managed until you can't manage anymore? We're offering grief share again at, this at the end of this month. Some of us have just bottled it up until it's ready to explode. Some of us have ignored it so long that we trip over the dirt we keep shoving underneath the rug. Denominations that don't deal with theological differences will find a way to eventually fuss and fight and to separate. How many churches of Jesus Christ are there? I didn't ask the denomination. One church of Jesus Christ. But listen to me. The earliest disciples were dysfunctional. They had their own stuff and they had stuff between them. And somehow in that reality, they created the church. Created a place where Jesus was glorified, where God was lifted up, where the Holy Spirit could come and dwell in and among them. You know, Jesus shared a tender moment with them. Think about it. <coughs> I'm going to have to get a cough drop. He said, you know, guys, I'm going to Jerusalem. It's a problem. I'm going to die. It's not going to be a pleasant death. And by the way, one of you is going to betray me. So he shared this tender moment. How would you react if Jesus shared that with you? How would you react? Yeah, you can react like Peter. No, no, you know, and Jesus says, no, Peter, get behind me. You, you can't stop this. This is of God. Or maybe he'd, you'd react like we do many times in the church and in our families. We say, well, you know, it's not that big of a deal. Maybe it'll just go away, right? You know, maybe Jesus just had a bad burrito, you know? I mean, we don't know. So, but here's how they reacted. The disciples began to argue about, okay, who's going to be in charge? Jesus is going to be gone. Who's going to be the big dog left in the kennel? You go, what? Why would they do that? It, it happens. I remember I serve in a large church, and, uh, you know, I've always been kind of a notion, the grindstone guy. Lisa can attest to that. And uh, anyway, I decided to take the month of July off. There you go. The entire month. 
And in my staff meeting, there was turmoil. They were like, well, who's going to be in charge? I go, you're all in charge, just like you are today. You're going to keep doing what you're doing. You're going to do what you need. went right down the list. You know, and they were just astonished. I said, we have built a team here. I'd been there about three years at the time. We built a team, and you each is responsible for leading yourself and leading a significant part of the ministry, or you wouldn't be on the team. So I'm getting ready to take two weekends off here at this church, June 12th and June 19th. Colby's going to come and preach. He's fresh out of seminary. He's the guy you want to hear, okay? So come, bring your family, bring your friends, fill this place out. Kids he went to high school with, college with, uh, people in the neighborhood, people were in the youth group. Fill this place up for Colby and Hannah. Can you do that? There you go. And, of course, Marilyn's in charge of everything else. Marilyn and Linda. So. <laughs> and, and Dave and Jeanette and worship. And We're a ministry team. Literally, I mean, I had somebody ask me, well, you, what's our security plan if somebody breaks in with a gun? I said, well, I'm a pretty big guy. I don't move very fast. I can back up the ushers. And the ushers go, what? <laughs> We're a team, a team. Mark 10, 37 through 39. James and John said to Jesus, just so you don't think I'm making this up, said, uh, we want to sit in places of honor. One at your right, one at the left. But Jesus answered, you don't know what you're asking. Are you able to be baptized with a baptism of suffering that I must be baptized with? And what did they say? Yeah, 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 we are able. You know the song, right? Are you able, said the master. Some of you are going, I'm, I'm too young, Jerry. I don't know this. So the toughest leadership challenge is always yourself. We always think we're able. We always think we're not filled with pride. And almost always, that's absolutely wrong. You see, leadership isn't about power. It's really about unselfishly pouring your time and energy and effort into other people. That's what it means to be a leader. At every church I've served, I've always made sure that when they have the leader list, I'm at the bottom because I support every other ministry leader. That's my role. See, there are two basic ideas. The way of the world which has led to so much dysfunction, not just out there, but in the church and in the way of Jesus. Read it with me, would you? So Jesus called the disciples together. You know that in this world, kings are tyrants, and officials lord it over those under them. But among you, it should be really different. So whoever wants to be a leader among you must be your servant, and whoever wants to be first must be the servant of all. For even I, the Son of Man, came not here to serve, be served, but to serve, and to give what? For a ransom. Why do you pay a ransom? You get back something that was lost or taken. Servant leaders in the kingdom movement called the church. We willfully and thankfully and joyfully give our time, talent, and treasure to building the church to reach the lost. That's what it means to be a follower of Jesus Christ. Okay. Two basic models. Everybody familiar with the boss model? Yeah. yeah, yeah, where the burden isn't just whatever the mission is, whether it's in public or schools or your neighborhood or your church or the world. Uh, the idea of the leader is supposed to be uh, carried around by the followers. I mean, we become part of the, the burden that people have to carry. And so they, they sit on top of whatever it is, and they say, this is what you must do, and this is what you must do. And Jesus says, that's not who you are. You're not a tyrant telling people what to do. In your marriage, if you're the boss, you're standing against the teaching of the Christ. In your church, if you're that kind of a boss, you're standing against the teaching. If you're in your business or whatever associations you're part of, if you're that kind of a boss, you do what I say, you know, in the military, you know, they say jump, and what are you supposed to say on the way up? How high? Jesus says not so. Okay, you are called to be a leader. Where is the leader in that second picture? In the front, saying what? We can do it. This is how we can do it. What do you think? Okay, and here's basically what this boils down to. It's the message of Pentecost. Read the bottom with me, would you? What can I do to help? You may have never thought of Pentecost this way before, but it's absolutely true. 
Jesus Christ was born, he lived, he taught, he died, he rose again, and then he left. And at Pentecost, he sent the Holy Spirit. Ask this most important question. What can I do to help? The Holy Spirit, Christ living with us, is not lording it over us in the way of the world. He is leading us. A faithless generation. Our Heavenly Father sent His Son to die for us so that we can live together in a community of faith. And Jesus sent the Holy Spirit to be our guide and our strength. Pentecost. Read it with me one more time. What can I do to help? Here's our verses for today. Again, 3,000 joined with the other believers and devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and fellowship, sharing in the Lord's Supper and in prayer. And a deep sense of awe came over all of them, and the apostles performed many miraculous signs and wonders. You don't see God at work in the world today, not because he's not. You're blinded by your own light. You need to become less, as John the Baptist said, so Christ can become more. So I say to you, what I've said to everybody I've served at every church. What can I do to help? That's my role. I'm your spiritual coach. My spiritual coach is Jesus Christ through the Holy Spirit. Because I am a Pentecost giver. Amen? And on the night in which Jesus was betrayed, he... Uh, This is an open communion, by the way. You don't have to be a Methodist, don't have to be a member of this church. Many people have found saving grace through this sacrament. But uh, on the night in which he was betrayed, he gathered his friends in an upper room. And after they'd had this meal, he uh, took the bread and gave thanks. Then he broke it, and he gave it to his disciples then and to you today, saying, take and eat, this is my body broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Likewise, after the supper, he took the cup. And again, he offered thanks to the Father. And he gave it to them, saying, Drink from this, all of you, for this is the blood of the new covenant poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. As often as you drink it, including right now, remember the blood of Christ is what binds us together, no matter what would divide us. It is the blood of Christ that cleanses us from those sinful thoughts, those sinful emotions, and those sinful actions. If you confess your sins, we are assured through God's word that Christ will forgive your sins and cleanse you from that brokenness. Right now, close your eyes and bring up one particular thing that is weighing your soul. Say, Father, I don't want to carry this burden anymore. It's yours. I don't deserve it, but I trust that you will take it. I trust that Jesus is who he has said is he is. And I want this to be my personal Pentecost. I trust and I release my pain in Jesus' name. And all God's kids said, Amen. So Father, pour out your spirit on us, gathered here and upon these gifts of bread and wine. Make them be for us the body and blood of Christ, that we may be for this hurting world, the body of Christ redeemed by his blood. By your spirit, make us one with Christ, one with each other one in ministry to the whole world until we feast at that heavenly banquet in heaven. All honor and glory be yours, Father Almighty, now and forever. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. Would you take the cup and peel off the bottom? There you'll find a piece of bread. As you take that into yourself, remind you that you are part of the body of Christ. You were baptized in Jesus' name, not in a denomination. So be true to that body. Take and eat. And then turn the cup over and release the juice and accept that you don't always get it right. Neither do I and neither does anyone else. So in this cup of forgiveness, forgive yourself. Forgive them. And trust that Christ through the Holy Spirit will make forgiveness real. Take and drink.
Father, we thank you for the gift of salvation through your son, Jesus Christ. Holy Spirit, we thank you for the gift of conviction, for pointing out that in our life and our lives together, which brings pain to you and pain to others and really pain to ourselves. Father, release us from the pain. Free us for joyful obedience. In Jesus' name. And all God's kids said, Amen. Amen. All right, Dave, would you come and lead us, but not into temptation? Okay. Okay. Please stand, and we're going to close our service this morning with a song by Casting Crowns called Life Song.
are blessed to have such great talent up here today singing songs to God. Uh, you are singing a song to someone. You may be singing to yourself. You're the most important thing in your life. You may be singing a song to someone else who you think is the most important reason for life. Or you may choose to sing your song to God. Mm-hmm. On this Pentecost Sunday, choose to be reborn into that life song that will never end. May Christ be your light, your guide, and your life. In the name of the Father, the Son, and Holy Spirit, and all God's kids said, Amen. Amen. All right, have a beautiful week. Bridge now. Nothing? Uh-uh.